Well, no one's given a response to the first status challenge. Maybe they will in time, or maybe I'll do another one a little later. But in thinking about letting you know the proper way to argue for statism, there's something you need to understand about the way we respond to your pathetic non-attempts to defend the state. And this goes to another list that's been making the rounds. It was originally written by Christopher Cantwell, and Lord T. Hawkeye and Travis Retriever shared it on their respective DeviantArt journals and had a bit more to say about it. Once again, I'm passing it on with my own take and my own additions to it. It's written about libertarians, but I think it applies to everyone who opposes irrationality in all its forms. It's called Top 10 Reasons Libertarians Aren't Nice to You. And we get this all the time about how the bad libertarian called them a name or something. Interestingly, we get the same response from statists as we get from creationists, moon hoaxers, anti-vaxxers, anti-GMOs, just the whole gamut of woo. Again, there really is no difference here. So if you're a statist wondering why you get this treatment from libertarians, here are the top 10 reasons why. 10. Ridicule works. We tried being nice. It never worked. Sure, it's effective one-on-one -on -one in the real world, but when conversing on a public forum, being nice just gets you brushed aside, swept under the rug, and forgotten. Also, it's pretty much always the statists being jerks right out the gate, and our rudeness is merely expressing legit indignation over their dishonesty, fallacies, sociopathy, and other insanity. So playing the nice guy and relying on logic and reason just doesn't work. I don't want this to be true, but it is. Believe me, no one would be happier than me if everyone responded to reason and evidence. If that were the case, we would have already won this debate, and we wouldn't even be having this discussion. The state would not exist, and there would be no political arguments pertaining to it. Just as everyone would vaccinate unless some medical condition prevented it. Everyone would dump their Bibles and Korans and other holy books into the garbage and accept evolution and cosmology as the best explanation we've come up with so far for how we got here. And the existence of yet another genetically modified crop would be met only with a shrug. But here's the thing. What we've learned from statists more than any other kind of woo is that there's more of a that guy sucks so you should support me type of psychology behind all this. Leftists call everyone who opposes them fascists and racists and religious nuts and homophobes and greedy. Rightists call everybody who opposes them socialists and enemies of God. They promote xenophobia about homosexuals and immigrants and foreign countries that they want to go to war with. I mean, really, you statists are all hardly wants to talk. As I said back in part one, nobody who matters listens to hypocrites. It's unfortunate that this has become the nature of political discord. But that's the reality we're met with. You folks have obtained such wonderful political success by being completely miserable towards one another, so unfortunately, we have to respond in kind. We make fun of you because that is the nature of the discussions that we have been met with. We tear down your leaders and your people because they promote terrible ideas and we don't want people to take you seriously. Of course, the difference is that when we do it, we have reason and evidence backing us up. We don't just call you an idiot, we show why you're an idiot. Now, you might find that this really isn't a way to convince you of anything, but that brings us to number nine. If you already have an ideology, we're actually not terribly concerned with convincing you. Most people have no concept of politics, economics, science, or philosophy. If they take an interest in these subjects because of something we said, or because they are genuinely interested in finding some kind of objective truth, then we have some hope of bringing them over to our side. Those are the people we are primarily interested in convincing. Most people active in these discussions, however, aren't actually interested in finding any sort of objective truth. As far as we're concerned, the fact that they aren't already libertarians is evidence enough of this. They chose a side for whatever reason, and they represent their team for better or worse. Liberals don't tend to become conservatives, conservatives don't tend to become liberals, and neither tend to become libertarians. They have their team, and everyone else is the not-we. So when George W. Bush wages war in Afghanistan and Iraq, liberals say it's a horrible thing. At least until Obama gets elected and it becomes their war. Same thing when Obama steps up the raids on medical marijuana clinics in direct opposition to his campaign promises. It's their guys doing it, so it must be okay. At best, for us, they try to get libertarians to assist them with their own anti-libertarian political agendas. But trying to work with you generally ends up hurting us, and we've learned this lesson too many times to ignore it. 
Having an ideology tends to imply some study of the subject at hand. If you have studied government and determined that it has any potential to do anything positive, this implies that you're not really very good at processing information. And even if we're wrong about that, it should mean that you have rational, evidence-based arguments to make against us, the very same kind we make against you. The failures of the state are so numerous and ridiculously obvious that we find it difficult to believe any rational person could justify its existence. Just like we do with the moon landings, the evidence that they really happened is so overwhelming that your anomaly hunting based on your ignorance of physics and photography is just no match for it. Or your fear-mongering about the ingredients in vaccines when you know neither their purpose nor the effect they have on the human body. It wouldn't be so bad were it not for the fact that all of this information is right there at your fingertips, so your informed adherence to this absurdity tells us that you are pretty much beyond all hope of rescue. As James Randi said, The big question is, why do people believe in such things even when proof can be offered that it can't be that way? Because they're unsinkable ducks. They don't just want it to be true, they need it to be true. Some of them truly desperately need it to be true, and when you question their beliefs or try to prove them wrong, you're threatening them. So when we argue with you, it's not you we're trying to convince. We're doing it for the sake of others who might be watching. It gives us the opportunity to put the information out there, and while you reject fact after fact after fact, we undergo the not-so-daunting task of making you look like idiots so that others who may be watching have a negative opinion of you and your ideas so that they do not join your cause and advance them. It may not be very politic, but then... 8. We're not trying to win elections. Okay, some libertarians are, but this person is either lying about being a libertarian or has a different goal in mind where being elected is only a means to an end. As far as we're concerned, elections are a bad thing. We're trying to end them, not win them. The nature of the state is to make false promises to bait support from the people it victimizes. They promise to protect you from boogeymen. They promise to solve your economic problems. They promise to carry out the will of your deity. We see this as completely ridiculous. We know it will fail, and we know that most people are stupid enough to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. So we can't compete with it by popular vote in a system rigged to favor the statists. To a libertarian, being elected just means getting access to channels normally reserved for government. The goal is not to win your elections. The goal is to turn a large enough minority against the legitimacy of the state as to make its continued function impossible. And we don't actually need to win a single election to do that. When people stop believing in government, they're just a bunch of guys in suits with made-up titles trying to get people to fund their excessively long role-playing game. So there's absolutely no incentive to work with you in promoting candidates, which is the primary function of your political activity. You're right when you say, no candidate is good enough for us, no matter who runs for office, we will tear him down because nobody has the right to be our ruler. The good ones know that. It's the goal of the vast libertarian conspiracy. We want to take over the world and leave you alone. 7. We've already had this discussion a hundred times. The operative term here is Pratt, previously refuted a thousand times. If you had ever bothered to study the works of any of the great libertarian theorists like Harry Brown, Murray Rothbard, Mary Ruart, David Berglund, and so on, you wouldn't be asking us the questions you are asking. You ask, who will build the roads? Or what about defense? You tell us, there is no such thing as utopia, and a lot of other really tired arguments. It shows us that you haven't taken so much as 10 minutes out of your miserable life to even make the slightest effort to understand what we are proposing. Really, it's no different from a creationist asking, if we evolved from apes, why are there still apes? It's not just that we've answered the question over and over again, it's the fact that these answers are readily available to you in a matter of seconds, and you still don't feel the need to look for them before you try to use them as a trump card in a debate. Over at Bogosity.tv, we call this Pulling a Lindy, named after Michael Lind of Salon.com, who asked, If your approach is so great, why hasn't any country anywhere in the world ever tried it? And arrogantly proclaimed it as, The question libertarians just can't answer. Which, of course, had already been answered a thousand times, and was answered again as libertarians responded to his article en masse. And pulling these talking points from your favorite website is not a way to impress us with your Google-foo skills. Not when you ignore the numerous times the question has already been answered. 
The proper thing to do there is take our answer and give your response to it. This is called furthering the conversation. By refusing to do this and continuing to pull one Lindy after another, you indicate to us that you have no interest in furthering the conversation. You want it to stay right where it is, most likely because you don't like the direction you see it inevitably going. Notice how none of us do this. Quite the contrary, we are always staying tuned to the propaganda you consume so that we can reason through it. And we find it quite easy to find the counter to these claims and assertions. We write thoughtful articles and make informative videos and produce compelling audio content that explains in great detail exactly what it is your politicians, pundits, and propagandists are saying and why it is wrong. You don't pay attention to any of that content because it's not coming from your team, and everyone on your team repeats the same propaganda. So every time we get into a political argument, we already know what you're going to say as soon as we know which team you're on. It's just like in the recent debate between atheist Matt Dillahunty and Christian apologist Saiten Brugenkate. It's unreasonable to begin by presupposing the proposition in question. It is unreasonable to believe something merely because it has not been proven wrong. And it's boneheadedly silly to claim that you can't possibly be proved wrong and pretend that that settles the argument. And as to whether or not we can know anything, the only demonstration that I can give is that I wrote this rebuttal ahead of time. <laughs> We already have the response to your propaganda, and we already know that you're going to act irrationally when we respond. This is extraordinarily frustrating, because we've actually put a great deal of effort into this, and these repetitive arguments are tiring, especially when they yield no results. And the most interesting thing about this is, we don't have just one answer to these questions, we have many and varied answers. Which also tells you something. If you can come to a conclusion from many different lines of reasoning, you can be pretty doggone sure it's the correct one. It also tells us something else about the numerous different possibilities we raise. 6. All those what-ifs you're so concerned about? They're called choices. The nice thing about freedom is, people get to make their own decisions. We're not entirely sure why this bothers you so much. Every time you ask us, what if X, we have a thousand different answers we can give you. If you don't like the first one, we're happy to give you another. The fact is, we don't know the best way to build the roads or provide defense or test the safety of medicine. The point is, you get to decide for yourself which solution you prefer in a market environment. You have become so used to the state being the arbiter of all things that you seem to panic at every uncertainty. The funny part about this is, the state hasn't provided you with any certainty at all. There's absolute chaos in the world. The police lock you up for videotaping them or for having a certain plant in your pocket. Cities shut down your hot dog or lemonade stand because it competes with their restaurant cronies. States use enforcement as a means of generating revenues rather than keeping the peace. And governments all over the world have murdered 260 million of their own citizens in the last century, not including wars, and you're still freaking out about speed limits. Again, we have the answers to all of this fear-mongering. But the problem is... 5. I can't teach you economics in 140 characters or less. The nice thing about the internet is, it allows us to communicate with many people very quickly. The downside is that this instant gratification has led people to believe answers will just be fed to them in sound bites without them having to put in any actual effort. If you really think you're qualified to walk into a voting booth and decide who will run the world and how, then you should have the common decency to study economics first. All these discussions we're having really boil down to economics. Your politicians and propagandists feed off your prejudices and religious ideas and emotions because that's the easiest way to manipulate you into acting against your own best interests. These tactics allow them to operate in a soundbite world and oversimplify matters. But as has been remarked many times before, a lie can finish speaking before the truth can take a breath. For us to explain to you what's wrong with those sound bites actually requires some understanding of how human beings respond to incentives in a market environment. We produce thousands of pages of text and countless hours of audio and video explaining these things. The best we can hope for in a tweet is to link you to some of it and hope you read or listen or watch. But you never do, do you? As Murray Rothbar said, 
It is no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is, after all, a specialized discipline and one that most people consider to be a dismal science. But it is totally irresponsible to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in the state of ignorance. Yes, I know, you have to be pretty smart to read and understand economics, but then... 4. We actually are smarter than you. The Triple Nine Society, an organization whose membership is reserved for people with IQs in the top one-tenth of one percent, even more discriminating than Mensa, did a survey on the politics of its members. The results don't surprise us. Members overwhelmingly supported legalizing all drugs, prostitution, and gambling. They supported gun rights and free markets. They opposed subsidies, government involvement in medicine, and income taxes. Government is a scam. And like other scams, it relies on the gullibility of its victims. We're not falling for it, but you are. And your support of that system harms us. Your stupidity literally hurts. On a similar note, 3. Our moral superiority is justified. We know you have some pretty twisted ideas on morality that stem from religious indoctrination and other primitive modes of thinking, but logically speaking, morality should be consistent. If your moral platform can't be applied universally, then it really doesn't make a great deal of sense. That's why your politicians, religious leaders, and propagandists are always getting caught doing things that go against the words they speak. Priests get caught having sex with children. Socialists acquire vast amounts of wealth. Family values politicians get caught cheating on their wives or hiring gay prostitutes. Gun control advocates murder millions of people. Their moral platforms are inconsistent. This makes them rather meaningless, and there is no reason for them to adhere thereto. The government claims to be there to protect you from violence, yet employs violence to do this. So for government to be valid, the initiation of violence must be both moral and immoral, which is completely inconsistent and therefore invalid. All arguments for government self-detonate as they require the government to be exempt from the very principles they're founded on. Our moral platform is basically just the non-initiation of force. As long as we don't rob, assault, kidnap, and murder, we're perfectly within our moral code. This is pretty easy for most people since violence doesn't appeal to us and we rarely end up looking like hypocrites. Which really boils down to... 2. We're not asking for much. As I said in part 6 of my Atheism and Libertarianism series, if you want to build a factory and run it according to Marxist principles, go for it. If you want to get together with like-minded people and create a communist enclave, feel free. However you feel people should interact with each other, we'll let you find others who want to interact with you in that way. Likewise, if you feel that some group of people knows how to live your life, and you want to have them threaten you all the time and tell you what to do, that's your business. We don't recommend it or anything, but really, you're more than welcome to submit to someone else's authority in the absence of the state. We might talk to you about the virtues of freedom, but we're honestly not trying to force you to be free. All we're saying is, you have no right to force us under the same authority. By contrast, you want to take our property, force us into wars, hurt our children into indoctrination camps, and control our business and personal relationships. You have some really weird idea in your head that this notion of government makes that okay, when you would never accept this from any other group of people. We don't believe in government. We see government as nothing more than a group of people, people who are not saints or demigods, and so we consider them to have no greater knowledge or ability than any other group of people on the planet. So we look at this like any other lunatic trying to do these things to us. Just let us decide to do something different. Is that really so much to ask? Apparently it is because... 1. You always resort to violence. Polite discussion in state politics is an illusion. At the end of this discussion, it really doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. The person with the superior numbers is going to force their bad ideas on everybody else at gunpoint. Just imagine doing this in reverse, where you start with a threat instead of ending with it. Nobody would try to be polite about their disagreement under those circumstances. Violence is at the heart of it all. Every single law and regulation is ultimately backed up by the threat of force. If you don't believe that's true, then take something the government does that you morally disagree with and refuse to pay the portion of your taxes that funds it. Watch what happens. If you continue to resist, a gun will be pointed at you. 
Since we know we have inferior numbers, and the minority always gets screwed and threatened by democracy, this is exactly what this discussion looks like to us. It begins and ends with the threat of violence, and you seem to think it's perfectly okay to use violence against us for not merely giving you free goodies or bodies to use in war. So the fact that we don't shoot you in the face really speaks volumes to our patience and civility. You give us absolutely no option for escaping this violence. We are forced to choose between the violence of you or the violence of someone else. You tell us, love it or leave it, or move to Somalia. Like I don't have any right to be left in peace in my own home. All while having the gall to accuse us of being the uncivil and uncouth ones. The fact of the matter is, if you give people a choice of violence or violence, then eventually us mocking you on YouTube will become the least of your concerns. You reap what you sow, people. This is the question I have asked over and over and over again, and still have not received any kind of answer for. If your solution really is the best one, why do you have to impose it on everyone by force? Remember, in a libertarian society, you'd be free to pursue your favorite solution, and if we look at it and see that it works, we might well abandon what we're doing and join you. But you have to convince us. Using force to implement it tells us that you have no rational way of doing so. What this all boils down to is another case of belief in belief. You may honestly and sincerely think you believe that the state is the solution to these problems, but if you really believed it, honestly and deep down believed it, you wouldn't feel you had to use force to make us comply. You wouldn't be afraid of alternatives. You wouldn't engage in special pleading to exempt the state from your moral code of conduct. You'd do research instead of repeatedly pulling a Lindy and arguing in sound bites. You wouldn't be so afraid of choices and of other people doing things differently. And we wouldn't have to repeatedly have the same discussion over and over and over again. And then you wouldn't get this ridicule from us. You'd be helping to further the discussion and get to the truth. But then, the truth might end up being something other than what those on your team say it is. And that's really what you're afraid of, isn't it? So tell me, after considering all this, why don't you deserve all the ridicule we can give you and then some?